before I started studying mitochondria and water and their impact on things like cellular health versus cellular dysfunction, I had never heard of the word deuterium. And so I want to kind of break down what deuterium is and talk about why deuterium may be impactful in what you're seeing in clinical practice. So number one, deuterium is just a version of hydrogen. And so it's important to be aware that atoms have oftentimes what are called different isotopes or just different variations of themselves where they have additional neutrons, essentially. The electrons and the protons stay the same, which essentially identifies an atom as its unique atom um, or as its unique element, if you will. But without changing the charge, if you will, the protons and the electrons, by the addition of a neutron, you can change the size of a particular atom and therefore potentially impact how it behaves in things like the human body. And that's exactly the case with deuterium. So deuterium is just a version of hydrogen and there are three different versions of hydrogen. So they're technically called protium, deuterium, and tritium. For our sake, we're not going to talk about tritium as it's not necessarily impactful in our, in our discussion here. However, we are going to talk about protium and deuterium. And instead of calling it protium, I'm just going to call it hydrogen because typically that's the quote unquote regular version of hydrogen when we think about what hydrogen is, which is essentially one proton and one electron. Simplest atom on the periodic table. Um, although Walter Russell might have something different to say about that, but that's for a different discussion. So anyways, with, with the one proton, one electron, it's a very, very small atom. And what happens then is when you have a variation on it, now all of a sudden you have deuterium, which is a version of hydrogen that doesn't just have one proton anymore. It's now a proton plus a neutron. And because neutrons are essentially the same size as a proton, you've doubled the size of hydrogen which because hydrogen, hydrogen's benefit it, a lot of times in the body, the reason why the body has selected hydrogen in certain instances is because of its unique size, its small size. And one of these instances is in the mitochondria. So in the mitochondria, remember, you've got this electron transport chain where essentially negative charge is being passed from um, step to step to step in the electron transport chain respiratory proteins, the end result of which is the production of water. And, you know, a healthy cell, healthy mitochondria, we're making, oh, you know, a little under a liter of water all day inside of our bodies, inside of our cells from our mitochondria. They're really designed to be water producers for us. And if you have you know, heard me speak at all about that water inside of the cell, remember that water inside of the cell becomes this beautiful gelled exclusion zone water. And this gelled exclusion zone water gives the cell its healthy charge uh, amongst so many other things that are needed for that, that water can do for us. And so we want to maintain adequate amounts of this beautiful intracellular water, this exclusion zone water. And so if there's something that negatively impacts that production in the mitochondria, essentially we're going to see things that can start to create mitochondrial dysfunction, drain the charged water, and then lead to pathologies. And so well, how does deuterium come into play here? Well, remember, as uh, the, you know, how does, how do electrons get to the mitochondria in the first place? Well, one of the main ways that they get there is because hydrogen from food essentially acts as a carrier. And so that hydrogen can go to, uh, it was, it, you know, it's, it's essentially um, broken off of food in, in things called like the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And it gets sent to the mitochondria where the hydrogen is in a unique uh, position where it has one electron and one proton. It can donate its electron to the electron transport chain. And then it's got a naked, now a naked hydrogen is just a proton. And so they can donate its proton into the inner membrane space and build up this prote uh, proton gradient there. Uh, very much called the mitochondrial membrane potential or like a pressure, viewed like as a pressure pressure gradient. And so as that pressure gradient builds up, those protons in that inner membrane space are looking for a place to go. They don't, it's, they want to, they, you know, uh, pre in terms of pressure modulation, it wants to seek a lower pressure. And it can do this by making its way through step five of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, which is called the ATP synthase or the ATPase. And as those protons go through the ATPase back into the um, inner membrane, uh, are the matrix of the mitochondria, the kind of the deep core of the mitochondria, the rate at which that ATPase spins allows for the production 
of ATP. So perfect, right? And remember, ATP also works to maintain the gelled water in the cell. That ATP binds to proteins in the cell so that the proteins can be in their very healthy, elongated state, which they need to be. And as their proteins are uh, kind of unraveled and put into their elongated state, naturally potassium comes in and wants to bind, right? And so that's how potassium is almost like magnetized into the cell as these protons expose, I'm sorry, as these proteins unwind and expose certain key binding sites for potassium. And so this is very healthy. This is what we want to have happen inside of the cell. So how can deuterium kind of mess things up here? Well, if instead of uh, just a regular hydrogen donating its electron and its proton uh, to the mitochondrial, you know, electron transport chain and inner membrane space, that mitochondrial membrane potential, what happens is what happens if it's not just a proton, but a deuterium where there's a proton and a neutron together? Well, now you've actually doubled the size of the proton or what is seeking to go back through the ATPase into the core of the mitochondria. And this ATP synthase is designed simply for the proteum version of hydrogen. And my favorite analogy for this is a basketball, right? A proteum is one basketball. A deuterium is essentially combining two basketballs together. And if any of you have ever played basketball before, you know that the hoop is really well designed to have one basketball be shot through very efficiently, right? You know, if you if you were, if you were a good shooter, you could really quickly make several baskets. You could swish several baskets with just one basketball. But what happens now if you have two basketballs connected to each other and the hoop stays the same size? You can jam things up quite a bit. How unlikely is it going to be for that, that, that double basketball to perfectly go through the hoop to allow more basketballs to continue through? It's very unlikely. And so if all of a sudden now you get deuterium into the ATP synthase, you gum it up you slow its spin down. And as you do that, you create um, a, a kind of like a backlog or a disruption in the electron transport chain process and a backlog in where water is being produced. So now you've got a lack of ATP, a lack of water, a, uh, excessive reactive oxygen species being produced because that's what happens when mitochondria have to become dysfunctional in their, in their ability to flow electrons and protons. And that creates that additional mitochondrial damage. And so now you can see how this type of an effect can ultimately over time reduce that charged water, reduce AT, reduce ATP production, and ultimately result in cellular dysfunction. So you may be asking yourself, where does this deuterium come from? Well, it actually, it, we're designed to have a certain amount of deuterium in key places in our body. For example, our blood is designed to have a, uh, have what uh, approximately 150 ppm, which is parts per million of deuterium. Our connective tissue is designed to hoard this deuterium. We want the deuterium to be able to, de deuterium stronger than regular hydrogen. And our connective tissue is this very beautiful tensegrity network of strength that's responding to our movements and, and our, you know, basically our proprioception, what our body needs to do at any given moment in, sp in space. And so we need deuterium in key places. But when we overconsume deuterium rich foods out of season, and also we're drinking deuterium uh, rich water, we can't necessarily overcome the amount of deuterium that's coming into our body, and it ends up getting into the mitochondria. Uh, the addition of glyphosate to our food supply and our water supply, frankly, also creates a dysfunction in the enzymes that are designed to just isolate the proteum version of hydrogen. And instead, they become less specific in their ability just to isolate the healthy protein version of hydrogen and send it to the mitochondria, and now are also uh, bringing deuterium to the mitochondria. So it's this vicious cycle. And so I'm not saying that all deuterium is bad, but for me, for example, living in Michigan in the middle of winter, I wouldn't necessarily have access to deuterium-rich foods. Deuterium-rich foods are foods that are grown in the tropics. They are carbohydrate and sugar rich foods. So essentially I would look in the winter time to be exposed to way less deuterium in what I'm able to consume. And that's great because my body then uh, is not necessarily going to be overburdened by deuterium. 
in the middle of summer, let's say at the height of when the produce season is for me, and I'm going to be able to consume a lot more deuterium rich produce. That's great because then at the same time, I have access to a much more infrared and ultraviolet from the sun, which I'm not going to go into detail here, but those help the body to both deplete deuterium and sequester deuterium in places like the connective tissue or in the blood volume where it's beneficial for us. And so, you know, deuterium is not all bad, but we don't want it to overburden the mitochondria. Hence why there's some amazing research out, researchers out there like uh, Laszlo Boros and Gabor Sommelier who have extensively studied deuterium and deuterium depletion as a therapeutic strategy for things like cancer, uh, even metabolic syndrome, diabetes. And so if you're interested in diving deeper, feel free to dig into that research. It's amazing. And it, it, deuterium is definitely a topic that I bring up in my practitioner trainings because it's oftentimes overlooked and it can be quite simple to help someone implement a deuterium, a number one test for deuterium and implement a deuterium depletion strategy. That doesn't just involve drinking deuterium depletion water in my clinical experience, but also involves controlling the amount of deuterium we're consuming from food, making sure we're not consuming excessive glyphosate, really trying to reduce our exposure to that, and also applying adequate exposures of infrared and ultraviolet, depending on things like the time of year. So hope that gives you a little bit of interesting information all about deuterium, uh, deuterium's impact in the mitochondria, and why it may be a missing factor. When we're talking all about food, people aren't oftentimes taking the deuterium content of the food, or frankly, the deuterium content of the water that someone is consuming into consideration. And that can be impactful when it comes to helping mitochondria regain their healthy, efficient metabolic function.